something then. Okay. Good morning. Good morning. I want to welcome you here this morning. I want to ask that you stand with us. We're going to sing together. We're going to sing, start our worship by just thinking about the one who makes the heavens, the one who shaped the earth, right? This God that we love.
someone next to you this morning. Welcome them here. Good morning. Welcome to church. It's glad to see each of you here this morning. It's good to be together to worship. Uh, we want to just share a few things with you, but before we do, if you're a guest with us today, we are very glad that you are here. Uh, there is a blue card in front of you in the pew. If you're interested in the church and want to know more about the church, please feel free to take that card, uh, fill it out, and then later on in the service when the offering plate comes by, you can put that card in the offering plate. We'd greatly appreciate that, and we can be in contact with you about who we are and what we believe as a church. And for any of you, if you have any prayer concerns, you can use the other side of that card to share those prayer concerns with us. As a staff, we would love to pray for those things this week, so please feel free to use it for that as well. There's a few things we want to highlight. Uh, you, uh, first and foremost, you might have noticed on the way in this morning that the the Operation Christmas Child plane uh, has landed. There was weather this morning, but it was fine. It wasn't an issue at all. And uh, you see people uh, around church this morning uh, wearing uh, Operation Christmas Child shirts. Uh, they sort of invaded, and that's okay. Um, you get to hear a lot this morning about uh, what's happening through this ministry. So I'll, I'll get out of the way. Well, it's my privilege and honor to be able to introduce some special guests this morning. And uh, but before I do that, uh, I need to share with you that Jorane and I have been, as many of you know, the coordinators here as a drop-off site for uh, eight or nine years or more. Um, been involved packing shoe boxes even longer than that and um, have experienced uh, extreme joy. Um, being the coordinators, we get to go to some conferences and hear speakers. So we've heard, we've heard a number of uh, what we call full circle speakers. There's two that stand out in my mind. Um, and I've shown you some of these real short video clips over the, number, over the last six or seven years to get ready for the packing parties and, and, and packing. But the two that stand out in my mind, one was Alex from Rwanda and the genocide that he went through and experienced, and then Kojo. And as I shared this morning, I don't remember the specifics of Kojo's story, but at the end of his testimony, when he says, I have to sing my favorite song that he learned through the greatest journey and through getting a shoebox, and it's that simple little chorus, Jesus loves me, this I know. So it's my pleasure to introduce this morning, uh, first of all, Elizabeth Henry, uh, who's come to share with us. Uh, she will be sharing her, her testimony and, and uh, how she was impacted uh, getting a shoebox. We also have Connie Zinn from our Mid-Atlantic Regional Office and Barbara Stopa, our area coordinator. So uh, enjoy. I'm sure you're going to be blessed by Elizabeth's story, and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you, Jim, as always. Um, as Jim said, I'm an area coordinator for Operation Christmas Child. I oversee the Morris, Warren, and Sussex counties. Um, I've been blessed uh, to pack shoeboxes for over 20 years, be a volunteer for Operation Christmas Child for that long. I've been the area coordinator for four or five years now. And um, Jim and Jereen have been the drop-off uh, team leaders here, and they're a great, huge blessing to us. They've been doing it, I think it's over 10 years, <laughs> or 10 or plus years here, uh, um, faithfully. But I also want to thank the pastors, Pastor Glenn, Pastor Aaron, for allowing us to come in and, and come alongside of you guys and encourage you guys to pack those boxes. Um, it's a blessing that they allow us to do that, and we don't take that for granted. We count that as a privilege. Privilege, truly and um, for each one of you 
I want to thank each one of you. Every one of you who have packed a box, you're going to hear how that shoe box has impacted a child. Um, I'd like to call it a little mission trip in a box. It's not just about the toys. And as I heard uh, Elizabeth share, um, you're going to see what a huge impact those boxes actually make. So I just want to, again, thank um, all of you, because it really makes a difference. You have no idea, but you're going to hear today through Elizabeth how you can touch, and you have touched hundreds, if not thousands, just through this church alone. So I wanted to take the time to just say thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, Jim and Jereen. Thank you, pastors. So God bless. I know you're going to be blessed by her testimony today. Thank you. Well, again, uh, there's more information about Operation Christmas Child. You're going to hear more in just a little bit. Uh, but I just will highlight that at the Welcome Center, there is a, uh, a pamphlet like this with weekly donation suggestions. Uh, and you can grab one of those to know what to, to start bringing along with you as we look forward to the collection week, November 13th to the 20th. Uh, a couple other things. One, just looking back, yesterday we had a wonderful uh, family disability conference here. And uh, so grateful to the um, One Body, Many Parts team, uh, uh, Daryl and leading that up. And uh, just what a great, a great time yesterday, being encouraged, being challenged. Uh, families that are affected by disability uh, were, were greatly encouraged yesterday, uh, my family included. And we're so grateful for that. So grateful for Pastor uh, Mike Betis, who is here with us this morning. If you could just even just raise your hand just so they can see. There he is. He's right there. He, he did a wonderful job and uh, so grateful for his wisdom, uh, uh, shared some experiences in his own life, and we're thankful for your involvement yesterday so much. And uh, so we want to look forward as well, coming up next weekend, this coming weekend, Friday and Saturday, uh, we have the opportunity to be a part of Sussex Serve. Uh, if you haven't signed up for that, you still can sign up at the Welcome Center. Pastor um, Brian, I think of his name, it's like mine. Pastor Brian uh, would love to have you be a part of that, and he uh, is looking forward to having people come out. The only stipulation is if you can show up here by 9 a.m. on Friday or on Saturday, Lunch will be provided for you, and uh, looking forward to having opportunities to serve in the community, to, to meet some practical needs for people, and thereby have a chance to, to meet a spiritual need, too, and to talk about our Savior, Jesus. So we're looking forward to that. And then also, coming up November 4th is a Women's Advent Nativity Calendar event. Uh, and if you could sign up for that at the Welcome Center by October 22nd, we'd appreciate that. Uh, and there's more information about that in the bulletin. There's a box for that, a number of other things coming up. So please take a good look at what's in there and uh, make sure that you know the things that are coming up that might, might pertain to you. So if you, as we continue to worship, if you would stand with me, and we will do our verse of the week together from Matthew chapter 5. We'll say this together. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 16. Lord Jesus, more than anything else, today is a day to be about the name of our Lord Jesus being glorified, our Father in heaven being honored and praised. We pray, we ask you, God, to be at work in our hearts today. Let everything we say, let everything we do point to that goal. Lord, let us be worshipers of you today. We thank you for the privilege. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come to this place. We thank you for the hope that we have because of the cross. And Lord Jesus, we pray that your name would be lifted up today. In his name we pray, amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's a word that will bless your heart. Oh 
king of endless worth. No one could express how much you deserve. Though I'm weak and poor, all I have is yours. Every single
continue in our worship service and look to our great God in prayer. Let's pray. Dear God, we come before your throne this morning, and we do long to worship you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and your word says that you're clothed with splendor and majesty. We marvel, Lord, at your creativity and design as you made this amazing world. You're faithful in all your ways, and the same yesterday, today, and forever. We stand in awe of how you would love us, a broken and undeserving people, people created to reflect you but constantly distracted by sin. Father, thank you for paying the ultimate price by sending Jesus to be our rescuer. And it is all about you, Jesus to free us, Lord, from the power of sin and death and provide the only way for us to be in a right relationship with you. We thank you for the cross. And we pray as your people that we would take the message of hope in the cross to a lost world. Lord, you are the Lamb of God. We think of those in Las Vegas and those looking from around the nation on that city as it suffered just a horrific tragedy this past week. Father, many are looking for answers and are in pain. And we ask, God, that you'd help them to see that you are the remedy. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would be working and the body of Christ would be a light in a dark place. Father, we pray for our president and for other leaders in our nation. Give them guidance, discernment. Give them strength as they lead this country. Lord, we just want to pray for those within our own congregation this morning that are in need, whether they're physical needs, emotional needs, or even spiritual needs, Father. We pray for the Sickle family on the passing of Debbie's daughter-in-law, Stephanie. We just pray that you provide them with comfort and strength as they grieve. We also think of Barbara Banks this week as she recovers from hip replacement surgery. We just pray that it would be a quick recovery period and she would regain her strength ahead of schedule. We pray for others, Lord, that are hospitalized and hurting right now, Lord. We continue to live, lift up Ed Paul Stannis to you. We just pray, Lord, that you would just help him day by day as he makes progress, Lord. Be near to him. We thank you for the many ministries here at LFC that happen throughout the week. And this week, we look forward to the opportunity to be your hands and your feet during Sussex Serve. We pray that those we see and serve, Lord, would experience your love during these projects. We pray, Lord, that we'd have open doors to share the gospel of hope with them. We also thank you for Operation Christmas Child, the ministry. We thank you for the impact that this ministry has had around the globe. These mission trips in a box, Lord, what an awesome opportunity to be uh, demonstrating your love in practical ways 
And uh, we're so excited, Lord, to hear one story today um, that was a person that was changed, Lord, through this box. We also pray, Lord, for those serving around the world. We thank you for the, the jocks, Ralph and Anula, as they serve in the Middle East with Eagles of Peace. We thank you for their important medical work. And we pray, Lord, as they look to heal physical hearts, that they would also see the opportunities, Lord, to uh, point people to you and fix spiritual hearts as well. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we are not alone in this county in sharing the gospel. This morning, we just pray for Sussex West Wesleyan Church as they gather. We just pray for Pastor Will Vaughn. Just give him clarity as he brings the message that you've laid on his heart. And this morning, Lord, we want to lift up Elizabeth Henry to you. We're so grateful that the OCC team is here, and uh, she's going to share her story with us. Lord, you are at work around the world, drawing people to yourself. And we're so excited, Lord, to hear as she shares her testimony with us this morning. Finally, Lord, this morning we ask, as we continue in our worship, by taking our offering, that you would use it, multiply it for your kingdom purposes, and ultimately for your glory. We love you, we praise you, we owe everything to you. And it's in the powerful name of Christ we pray these things. Amen. This is a song by Mercy Me that seemed to be everywhere on the Christian radio station in April when I diagnosed with gastric cancer, and Steve and I chose it to adopt it as our song. It talks about our trials and our struggles, our mountains, our cancers, that God can heal and can take away, but even if he doesn't, we need to trust him and say, it is well with my soul. They say sometimes you win some, sometimes you lose some. And right now, right now I'm losing bad. I stood on this platform day after day. Reminding the broken it'll be okay But right now, oh right now I just can't It's, it's easy, easy to sing when there's nothing to bring me down But what will I say? When I'm held to the flame like I am right now I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone say it only takes a little faith to move a mountain well good thing a little faith is all I have right now but God when you choose to leave mountains unmovable Oh, give me the strength to be able to sing It is well with my soul I know you're able and I know you can Save through the fire with your mighty hand But even if you don't My hope is you alone I know the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you alone. You've been faithful, you've been good all of my days.
the sorrow and I know the hurt would all go away if you just say the word. But even if you don't, my hope is you Can you tell I'm excited to be here? Yeah. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Henry, and I'm a full circle speaker um, uh, on behalf of Operation Christmas Child. So what that means is that I just travel all over the United States, and I share my testimony and um, just encourage volunteers, just like you guys, to continue to pack shoe boxes or to get involved if you're not. Um, and I'm just very excited to be here, and I hope that as I share my testimony that God will just speak through me and open up your minds and touch your hearts in a special way or in the way that you need to be touched today as we go through this OCC season. So I was born in a small city called Sirupinsk, which is located in eastern Ukraine. And I was born to what seemed like a really happy family. But what I didn't know until later was that my father was an alcoholic. And when I turned one, he was killed in an alcohol-related accident. And so after his death, my mom just could not deal with the pain and the loss. So she turned to drinking herself and eventually became an alcoholic too. A couple years down the road, my mom found out that she was pregnant with my little sister, Tanya. And after giving birth, she knew that she couldn't support us financially. So she packed us up and moved us to live with our grandparents who lived in a nearby village. And my life in the village was very simple. We shared a two-bedroom cottage with my mom, my sister, and my grandparents. And we grew on food, and we had livestock, such as chickens and pigs. And I learned a lot of useful things growing up in the village, and one of those was hard work. I was very determined as a little girl to help my family succeed. And when I say simple, it was very, very basic. For example, there was no such thing as a fridge. We had a cement room that was lower in the ground, and that was supposed to provide the cold that we needed for the items. There was no such thing as a heating system. We had a furnace that was supposed to heat the entire cottage. And let me tell you, half the time it didn't. There was no such thing as a bank or even money sometimes. So we would grow our own food in the garden and then go to the market and exchange that food for whatever else that we needed that week or that day. And even though things were looking up, my mom's drinking never stopped. In fact, over the years, it got a lot worse. She used to leave for weeks at a time, and when she was home, she was extremely drunk, and there was a lot of fighting and yelling between her and my grandparents, and eventually, I just couldn't even recognize her. And on top of all of that, my mom got pregnant again, and this time with my younger sister, Ilona. And after giving birth, again, she was nowhere to be found. So here I was left to care for two younger sisters, and I knew that I had to step up and be the head of the household at a very young age. I felt responsible for them and their well-being. Um, and even though we were managing with the help of our grandparents, the youngest sister, Ilona, got really sick and passed away when she was just eight months old. And that was really difficult for me because I felt like I did something wrong, like that was my fault since I was taking care of her. But at the same time, I felt stronger and more prepared. And more than anything, I wanted to protect my other sister, Tanya. So I decided that Tanya and I would run away in search of a new life. I was only eight and she was only six. And this was the first time that I felt God's presence in my life. I had this overwhelming feeling that I had to do something. And back then, even then, I knew that life was not supposed to be that hard. So I took Tanya by the hand, we got on the bus and we left. And then the bus dropped us off at a nearby city the police eventually spotted us, picked us up, and took us to what is known as a detention center. 
So a detention center is a place where you take children for short stay for up to about a year, allowing their parents to reclaim the kids if they can, and if they don't, then the children are placed into an orphanage system. So Tanya and I just started to adjust to our new life, and we made a bunch of friends and joined several clubs. We were absolutely inseparable. We did everything together. But of course, one day, everything changed. And on that day, the detention center director called me into her office, and she said that Tanya's father was there to take her home. Tanya was my half-sister. And that was a very defining and a very difficult moment in my life, because on that day, I lost the only family that I had left. And I can still remember every single detail. I remember sitting on the steps and watching Tanya walk away, and she turned around to wave goodbye, and she had this huge smile on her face and just joy and happiness in her eyes. But all I could feel was complete heartbreak. I couldn't believe that the only family I had was being taken away from me, and there was nothing I could do about it. But at the same time, I knew that that was the best that I could do for her. So I put a smile on my face, I waved goodbye, and that was the last time that I saw her. Over the next couple months, I just spent my time crying myself to sleep and wondering, what's the point here? What's the meaning? What's the purpose? And I just completely hated the world and everyone around me. I felt abandoned and alone. And I just lost all hope. And in that moment, I just, I hit rock bottom. I was done. But of course, we are not done until he says we are. So after about a year at the detention center, I was transferred to an orphanage in the city of Berdansk, also in eastern Ukraine. And the orphanage provided me with food, clothing, and a place to sleep, and my first school experience. And I had classmates and house mothers, but of course, nothing resembling a family that I once had. And so I just pushed myself to excel and learn as much as I could. I started dancing, I participated in choir, and I learned how to cross stitch. And eventually, as a group, we were required to attend church every Sunday. And this was an Orthodox church. So at first, it was a chore for me. But after a while, I started to develop a relationship with Christ. I started praying every single night. And just looking back today, I know that he had never left me. He was with me every single step of the way. He was there when my mom wasn't there. He was with me when my sister left. And instead of leaving me at the bottom, he showed me how much he loved me through a simple gift, through a shoebox. That year, our orphanage was one of many select to receive shoeboxes. And we were called into a small room and told we were getting gifts. We were all just so excited because this was rare for us. They gave out the boxes, and I grabbed my box and ran back to the room, and I just started ripping it apart. And in my box, I found crayons, coloring book, hygiene items, school supplies, little pink girls' accessories, and of course, the gospel, small Bible in my own language. But the one thing that really stood out to me was a yo-yo. Of course, back then I had no idea what a yo-yo was. But I was so excited to have something of my own. And I remember running around the halls and showing it off to my friends. And I would say, look what I got. Look what I got. They would say, what is it? I'd say, I don't know. (laughs) But it wasn't about the yo-yo. Receiving that shoebox was the first time that I truly felt loved. I truly felt like someone cared. And I couldn't believe that some stranger somewhere in the world packed that shoebox just for me. That yo-yo represented hope. And it reminded me of God's unfailing love for his children. On that day, receiving that shoebox, I accepted Jesus as my family. And just knowing that he loved me and that he cared for me was all I needed to know and to get through whatever was coming my way in the future. When I turned 11, the choir that I was part of had the opportunity to travel to the United States for two weeks. And the organization that made that possible is called Heart for Orphans and is based out of Virginia. And the whole point of the trip was to promote adoption. During the two-week trip, we were hosted by families in North Carolina and Virginia. And during my second week, I was hosted by my family now, the Henry family. And on our last day there, the Henrys decided to take me to Walmart to buy me some toys to put in my, um, to take back with me to the orphanage. And um, on the way to Walmart, I fell asleep in the back seat of the car. And so my family went in, and then my dad decided to stay with me. And as he was just sitting there, he looked back to check on me, and he heard a voice say, she is your daughter. I was like, what? God said it again, she is your daughter. And then he knew he was stuck with me. So 
So he told my mom what happened, and that night they got a translator, they sat me down, and they asked me if I wanted to be adopted. And I said, yeah, duh. <laughs> and I did not speak a lot of English back then, but I knew the words yeah and duh. <laughs> so I put them together. Um, and so the Henrys began the process, which took two years altogether, uh, during which time they sent me letters and packages just to remind me that I am not forgotten and that they are coming for me. And so finally, in May of 2007, I became one of the Henrys at the age of 13. And so I just embraced my new life in America. I started going to a Christian school and I started playing soccer and softball. And we just bonded as a family. And so today I have two loving parents, two sisters, and a black lab named Hokey. Life is good and God is good. When I turned 14, I helped my family pack our first Operation Christmas Child shoebox. And the year after that, uh, Mom and I were walking through Target looking for items that were on sale to put in our box. And just walking through there, I suddenly remembered receiving an Operation Christmas Child shoebox. And that memory sparked the idea that I could do more, that we could do more as a family. So I turned to my mom and I told her what happened and I asked her if we could pack more boxes. And she said, yeah, honey, you can pack two more yourself. And I said, um, I was thinking more like a hundred. She's like, okay. Um, but after talking about it over dinner with my dad, we decided to give this crazy idea a go. And so we reached out to our extended family, to all the friends, all the clubs that I was in, sports teams, anything that we could think of. And that year, in 2011, instead of collecting 100, 100 shoeboxes, we collected 150 shoeboxes. The next year, we set our goal of 200 boxes, and we ended up collecting 268. Since then, Operation Christmas Child has been a family tradition. We do it every single year, and we love it. In 2013, I went to study at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, and I wanted to bring the project with me. Of course, I had no idea what to do, who to talk to, or where to begin. But I sat down and I prayed, and I asked for some direction. And he answered my prayers by making me realize that this was not about me or how I felt. This is about millions of children all over the world who need the hope that I was once given in that shoebox. So I just set out on the mission. I started uh, speaking in front of my classes, in front of sports teams and Greek life. And I'm happy to say that Virginia Tech accepted the project. And my freshman year, we ended up collecting 469 shoe boxes. I did not expect that many boxes, but I was so excited. So my sophomore year, we decided to make an Operation Christmas Child Club on campus. And today we have over 300 members so each year we set a goal, we pray about it, and we just pack shoe boxes. We love it. Um, my junior year, I wanted to get the Virginia Tech football team involved. You guys know about Virginia Tech football, right? Huge. Um, so the players and the coaches are seen as leaders in the community and on campus. So this was a big advertising opportunity for OCC in our club. And um, they were more than happy to participate. And then my senior year, we actually got to do an Operation Christmas Child football packing party. And that was such an amazing experience to see the players and the coaches just come together and become part of something that is so much bigger than them or the university. I actually graduated from Virginia Tech in May, and I was very, very hesitant to leave everything that we had built there in the last four years with Operation Christmas Child. So I needed to find someone who was going to take over. Um, and so I sat down and I prayed and prayed and prayed. And again, he answered my prayers by bringing our club into partnership with Fellowship of Christian Athletes. So they're going to take it over now. And I'm very excited about it because Virginia Tech has like 35,000 students and a huge athletic program. So I just pray and I ask you guys to pray with me every single day that the impact they have will be just exponential and amazing. So in the last six years altogether, we have packed over 4,400 shoeboxes. And today, 13 years after receiving my own Operation Christmas Child shoebox, I still talk about the impact that the gift has had on me. And it absolutely changed my life. I don't plan on ever stopping. This is part of me. This is part of my family. And over the years, it brought me so many blessings. And I actually got to experience one of these blessings just this July. I had the opportunity to firsthand deliver shoeboxes to the children of Madagascar. And that was an amazing experience, and it was my dream for so long 
just to come full circle, being able to receive a shoebox and to deliver one. And I said this in the first service and I'm gonna say it again. It is so much better to give than it is to receive. I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about what God is doing in Madagascar. Um, the Samaritan's first involvement in Madagascar began in 2003. And since then they have delivered um, over two million shoeboxes to that area. And my trip was only 10 days long, four of which we spent traveling to and from Madagascar. And when we got there, we stayed on an island called Nosy Bay, and we were divided into two different teams, red and green, and I was on the green team. During the entire trip, each team had the opportunity to do five outreach events, meaning we went out five times, and each time we delivered about 100 shoeboxes to 100 kids. And then we also got to sit in on one of the greatest journey lessons. And that was the most amazing part because we actually got to see the kids learn about Christ and how to have a relationship with him and then how to go out into the world and share the gospel with their families and their communities. And so each outreach event was amazing and such a unique experience. But it wasn't until um, my last day there that I actually got to see God work in those children. And on that day, uh, right after breakfast, around 8 a.m., we got on the boat and we went to another island called Nosy Comba, um, also known as the Island of Lemurs. And when we got there, we were expecting about 100 kids, most of whom were orphans and lacked proper care and education. We got off this boat and we started walking up the mountain. And as we were getting closer, we could just hear the children singing at the top of their lungs about Christ and his love for them. How amazing is that? We're in the middle of nowhere on this island. These kids have no shoes, no clothes, they're dirty. They're surrounded by extreme poverty. They're standing out under tarps, but they're saying about Christ and his love for them. That was such a humbling experience. And so when we got to the top, we met the children and the gospel was presented. And then we gave out the greatest gift booklets and then the boxes. And so we settled them on the kids uh, to help them open the boxes. And I sat at the very front between the two to four year old little girls. And so the pastor counted to three and all the kids opened their boxes at once, except this one little girl to my right. She was sitting there with both of her hands on her box like this. She wouldn't open it. I leaned down and tried to help her open the box, but she was not about it. She's like, I don't know you, you don't speak my language, don't touch my box. I was like, okay. So I leaned down to her again and I said, Tia Anau Zezosi, which means Jesus loves you in Malagasy. And I instantly saw a huge smile just growing on her face. And then I got the translator, I called him over to ask for her name, and her name is Sanya. After gaining Sanya's trust, I picked her up and I placed her in my lap and we just started going through all the stuff that was in her box. And the first thing that we took out were these pink and purple um, hard bracelets we put those on her wrist and they were way too big, but she rocked them anyway. She loved them. And then we took out um, princess and animal rings and we put those on her fingers. There were like six of them. And she loved those as well. And we just kept going through all of the stuff that was in her box. And the last thing that we took out was a stuffed gingerbread man. And I picked up that stuffed toy and I placed it in front of her face and I just tickled her little cheeks with his fluffy arms. And she spread her arms out and pulled it in for a big hug. And in that moment, I realized that that was her version of my yo-yo. And I found myself back in Ukraine, receiving my shoebox, getting my yo-yo, and just experiencing all the emotions that I experienced that day. And then suddenly, I felt bad for this little girl. I wanted to protect her. I wanted to save her. I want to take her back to the United States with me. Take away from all of this poverty. And the pastor stood up, he wanted, said that he wanted to pray over the kids. So I picked Sanya up and I just started praying over her. And I asked that God would just guide her and protect her. And I so badly wanted her to know that I was an orphan once. I received a shoebox and my favorite item was a yo-yo. It's gonna be okay. But more than anything, I wanted to for her, I wanted her to come into a loving relationship with him. And through all of this praying, suddenly I felt Ta Sanya's sweaty little forehead on mine. And I opened my eyes to see what she was doing. And all I could see were these big brown eyes right in front of mine, like this. 
And it looked like she was looking right through me. And just looking into her eyes, I felt like she already knew everything that I was praying for. And then she already had everything that I was praying for. And then I realized that I didn't need to feel bad for this little girl. I didn't need to feel like I had to protect her or to save her because she already had been saved. She received the greatest gift of all. She received Christ in her heart. And for the rest of the prayer, I would not break eye contact with Sonia. When I did, tears fell down my face. I was a complete mess. People would ask me if I was okay, and I'd say, no, I'm not okay. I saw Christ in that little girl. And that was an experience that I will never forget. I went to Madagascar thinking that I was going to change lives. But instead, that little girl just completely changed mine. And I came back so inspired and so motivated to share my testimony and to encourage volunteers just like you guys to get involved if you're not involved or to continue to pack shoe boxes, get your friends involved because these boxes do change lives. And the work that you do here does not go unnoticed because every single shoe box that you pack is sent with a gospel message. And every single child that receives that box has the opportunity to know him and to have a relationship with him. And that's the greatest gift right there. That's what's important. I came to know him 13 years ago when I received my shoe box. Sonia came to know him just this summer in July when she got her box. And there are so many children all over the world who are receiving the good news of Jesus Christ because you guys, the volunteers, the army of volunteers do the work on this end. Remember, we are not just packing shoe boxes full of toys. We're using those toys as a tool to send the gospel to those kids in the worst parts of the world. The box can break. The toys will fade, but the gospel will stay forever. It will. I want to thank you guys so much for packing shoe boxes and being involved in this wonderful ministry and remind you that you can always pack more. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Elizabeth. What a wonderful testimony. And we always want to ask the question when we've been challenged. We always want to ask the question, so what? What do we do now? And I think without a doubt that we need to heed the challenge that Elizabeth so beautifully gave us, and that is to pray and ask the Lord how we can be involved in this wonderful ministry that takes the gospel and hope and joy to children around the world. And I think uh, we heard you loud and clear. And as a church, let's, uh, let's pray about and let's be challenged. Let's pack more boxes. Um, and let's do that not only for the sake of packing more boxes, but knowing and, and being filled with the assurance that not only will they receive yo-yos and gingerbread men, but they will receive the gospel. And so I would challenge you uh, to really, during this season, to say, Lord, what more would you have me to do? Um, as you leave this morning, there will be uh, on the Welcome Center, uh, we provide a little, it looks like a bookmark that has a list of suggested items that you can be buying week by week through this season. Of course, there's an Operation Christmas Child Samaritan's Purse table out there um, with all kinds of information. But could that be our number one response to what uh, Elizabeth challenged us with this morning? What will we, we do? What can you do more to be a part of taking the gospel? Uh, out to, to children across the world. But I'd also like us to uh, respond to another challenge that Elizabeth gave us, and that is to pray for some things. I'd invite you, if you would, right now to bow your heads. And let's take a moment and let's pray first and foremost for the Virginia Tech uh, Fellowship of Christian Athletes chapter and that university. And let's just uh, honor what Elizabeth asked and let's pray that the Lord would continue and exponentially grow the work of Operation Christmas Child there. And I invite you to pray for just a few moments. And then, Greg, would you mind kind of vocalizing the prayer for us in a moment?
thank you that Elizabeth took the opportunity to s spread the news of this project, Operation Christmas Child, on the campus there at Virginia Tech. We thank you for the four years she poured into it for the club that grew out of, of her, her desire and her vision. Now, Lord, we lift up this chapter of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes that has taken us over. And, Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom to the leadership and to those involved. You'd give them boldness as they recruit and as they train and as they challenge. And Lord, we pray that you would take the fruit of their work and that you would use it to, to bring hope to those who need it around the world. But, Lord, we also pray that you would use this tool on their end as well. Lord, as those who know you, who are members of this club, participate, we pray you would encourage them and you would embolden them, that you would allow them to use this project as a way to start spiritual conversation with their peers and with, with those who look up to them as athletes, Lord. Lord, for those who don't know you, who participate, would the gospel be clear to them too? Would they, as they look at these boxes, as they look at what they're doing, would they ask the question, who are you? And why do you love these children all over the world so much? And why then do you also love them? Lord, use that tool. Uh, help the Fellowship of Christian Athletes to reach out into that campus in a big way. So help them to see life change. Help them to use their position as people looked up to because of something they do, Lord. And let them know who they know. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in the power of your name. Oh, and let's pray for the boxes that we pack. And would you pray not only that many boxes would be packed, though let's pray for that, not only here but across this county, but would you pray for the children? You don't know their names, you don't know their faces, but we know that the Lord does. So would you pray for each child who will receive a box in the gospel through our efforts here at LSC and beyond in this county. But would you pray right now for that? And in a few moments, I'd invite Jim if he would come and vocalize the prayer for us. But pray right now for each child who will receive those boxes in our efforts here at LFC. Father, we come before you and we thank you for the blessings that are new to us every day. We thank you for the opportunities that we have to, to have a gospel opportunity in something as small as a shoebox. We pray for each of the boxes that may be packed by our folks here, by the folks in this county, in this state, in this country, that each one of those will t be touching an individual's heart. We thank you for the hearts that have been touched, Alex and Kojo and Elizabeth and Sonia. Thank you for the power of your message and the power of your gospel. May it continue. May each of these kids that gets a box see Jesus and him only. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, Jim. What a great message and reminder of the hope that comes through Jesus and him alone. And, you know, we'd be remiss this morning if we didn't gather together and talk about the hope that some precious children, a little a little girl named Elizabeth, a little girl named Sonia, little children across the, the world, uh, we'd be remiss if we just talked about the hope that they found in Jesus and not remind each of us sitting here that that same hope, that same salvation, that same healing is available for each one of us. 
We may not be the ones receiving the shoebox, but we are reminded that the hope that is the message of the shoebox is the same message of hope for each one of that, and that is that Jesus saves, that it is through Jesus that we find hope, that we find meaning in life, that we find healing, and we find the promise and the, the hope of heaven. You may be here this morning, and you may be like many of those little children across the world who find themselves without family. Or maybe you're here this morning, and you say, I find myself in the midst of hopelessness, or I'm broken. Maybe you find yourself here this morning saying, I'm looking for meaning and purpose in life. Maybe you're here asking the biggest questions you can ask about things like heaven and eternity. Can I tell you the answer for you, your hope, your strength, your salvation, the answers you're looking for is the exact same answers that those precious children receive when they open that box and read and hear about Jesus. And just as those precious little children have been given a gift that they must receive, we're reminded that Jesus is the gift that we must receive as well. Understand this great truth. This is the gift that you and I ultimately on our own are helpless. We're hopeless. The Bible says we have all sinned. We all fall short of God's glory. And because we fall short of God's glory, we have no hope of spending eternity with him. And we're broken to the core that we really don't have meaning and purpose in life. Our sin has completely separated us from God. But the Bible says God demonstrated his own love for us in this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus came fully God and he walked this earth. He was sinless. He was perfectly obedient because we could never be perfectly obedient. And when Jesus died on the cross... He took our place. He took our punishment. He literally bridged the gap between our, our brokenness, our sin, our spiritual death, and the hope of knowing God and having a relationship with him and spending eternity in heaven with him. The Bible says not only did he die for your sin and my sin, but he was raised from the dead. He defeated death, and he offers, the Bible says, a free gift of salvation not by trying to be good enough, not by trying to clean ourselves up enough, not by trying to be religious enough, but by receiving this gift by faith and repentance. I love the picture of a little child not only being given a gift, but receiving it and, receiving it and opening it. And this morning, you may be at the place where you realize you need to receive the gift of what Jesus did for you. And through faith and repentance, through committing your life to Christ, opening it up and discovering what meaning and purpose is in life, what forgiveness is, what it means to have someone who never leaves you, never forsakes you. And knowing what it means that you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you'll spend eternity in heaven when you die. That is the gift. That is the greatest gift that has ever been given. So this morning, I would simply ask you this. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I don't care if you're religious, if you're good, if you're trying hard. All of those things fall short. But do you know Jesus? Have you come to a place where you've trusted him, committed your life to him? Have you received that free gift? If not, this, this gift is for you. Would you receive it? This morning, we're going to sing, as we always do at the end of our services here, we're going to sing a song. And the song is Make Me a Blessing, because I want us that know Jesus to be challenged, that we have a call to go and, and to be a blessing. We need to pray that God would make us a blessing through shoeboxes, through what we do this afternoon, at the workplace, tomorrow, at school. So in one aspect of this song is our response that knows of us who know Jesus to say, use me, make us a blessing. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus... Would you be reminded that the greatest blessing and the greatest gift ever given was what Jesus did for you on the cross? And while we're singing, if you know that you need him, why don't you pray and receive him as Lord and Savior? I'm going to be forward. There'll be some other pastors up front while we're singing. If you'd like to come forward and pray with one of us, 
We would invite you to come during that time. Maybe this morning you just feel led as we're singing that uh, to pray for what the Lord is doing through, through Operation Christmas Child. Or maybe the Lord's laid someone on your heart to pray for. The altar's open. We'd invite you to come and pray. Maybe you're saying, you know what, Pastor? I hear what you're saying, but I have more questions than I have answers. If you'd like to visit with one of us even after the service, we'll be forward. We'll be up front. We'd invite you to come. As everybody's leaving, we'd love to visit with you. Whatever the Lord's laid on your heart, would you respond? That's the so what this morning. Respond. Lord, make us a blessing. And if you don't know him, then receive the greatest blessing, the greatest gift that's ever been given. And that is a relationship with Jesus. Father, we pray as we sing this song this morning that we would respond however you've laid on our hearts. Lord, we pray that you would give us a passion to be a blessing. And Lord, for those who don't know you, may they receive the blessing, the greatest gift of Jesus, his love, his forgiveness, hope, and the promise of heaven. Father, we give you this time of response. May you be glorified however you see fit to call us to respond. And it is in Jesus' precious name that we pray. Amen. Would you Out in the highways and byways of life, many are weary and sad. Carry the sunshine where darkness is rife, making the sorrowing glad. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, O oh Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Tell the sweet story of Christ and his love. Tell of his power to forgive. Others will trust him if only you prove true every moment you live. Make me a blessing, make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine, make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray, make me a blessing to someone today. Give as t'was given to you in your need. Love as the Master loves you. Be to the helpless a helper indeed. Until your mission be true. Make me a blessing. Make me a blessing out of my life. May Jesus shine. Make me a blessing, O Savior, I pray. Make me a blessing to someone today. Amen, amen. Well, before we go, I just want to give us another opportunity to thank Elizabeth and the Operation Christmas Child team so much for being here. Uh, we appreciate you. You have blessed us, and thank you so much for being here this morning.
And I want us to heed that challenge. This is, tis the season to be thinking Operation Christmas Child. Let's, uh, let's do more boxes than we ever have because we know more boxes mean more children touched. I also want to, before we go, say one last huge thank you to our disability ministry team. Um, I know that uh, Ryan talked about that during the announcements, but what an awesome, wonderful conference yesterday. Um, I just, I was, I was inspired, I was challenged, and uh, I, I was visiting with somebody. Did you have a chance to introduce Mike? What's that? Oh, he raised his hand. So, Mike, thank you so much for being here and coming and sharing. What a what a wonderful weekend. Uh, the ladies on that planning committee did a fabulous job, and I'm looking forward to 2018 Family Disability Conference. And the Lord is going to use and bless that uh, that conference throughout the year. Mike, can I put you on the spot? my friend. And uh, would you come up here? And uh, again, we're privileged and honored to have you with us. Would you mind, uh, as we close, praying for us, praying for, uh, I'm just going to give you a whole list, Operation Christmas Child, right. that the Lord would continue to use um, our disability ministry for his glory. And would you particularly also pray for Elizabeth and her ministry that the Lord would bless her and then we'll be dismissed. Great. Thank you, Mike. Let's pray together. Our Father, how good, how glad we are that you have been so good to us to give us the, the blessing of Christ and life and hope and redemption and forgiveness and fellowship with you and with one another. How glad we are for stories from places far away and long ago where you have been active in changing the world through normal people in normal little places. God, we're grateful for Elizabeth and her story. We're grateful for the stories that are emerging in this place as lives are surrendered to you and hearts are open to serve others with the love that they have received from you. God, make this place a light in this community uh, as, as people are drawn here because of the hope in Christ and the welcome love being shared among these people with their neighbors. Bless Elizabeth and his team as they hit the road and, and go to other places. May their message redound to your glory and to the good of many people in many places. And may the efforts and the, uh, the faithfulness of people here at, uh, at, at Lafayette Federated Church also uh, expose your glory to more and more dark places and dark hearts that need the light of the love of Christ. Dismiss us with your peace, our Father. We are grateful for all you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen.